Bookstore and the Historical Society, I want to welcome you tonight. I'm Sarah Rooker, the director of the Historical Society. I'm slowly starting to meet everybody in town, so I see many familiar faces now, which is comforting. Um, <laughs> it's a delight to be able to um, co-sponsor this reading with the bookstore. And I was thinking about this talk today and realizing that if you love Ben and Jerry's, if you like to rock out to fish, if you shop at the co-op, or if you felt the burn this year, you've all reaped the benefits of the Back to the Land movement, of a movement um, from uh, the 1970s and 80s when Vermont experienced a 15% growth in its population in one decade. The largest expansion of um, flatlanders, I guess we might say, or people into Vermont since the 18th century. It was a massive um, shift in population, and Peter Gold was one of those folks who came here to Vermont, as um, I'm sure some of you were as well. Ask everybody to raise their hand. Yeah, who came that. here then? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you'll hear some familiar, familiar sounding tales. So Peter moved um, to Vermont, to Guilford, um, and to Total Loss Farm um, in the 70s. <clears throat> While he's been here in Vermont, he founded Youth Shakespeare Camps in Vermont. He became a professor of Meditation for Conflict Transformation at Brandeis University. Um, and he received last year the Ellen McCullough Lowell Lovell Award in Arts and Education from the Vermont Arts Council. So he's contributed much to arts and arts education in our state. Peter has chronicled the Back to the Land movement in fictional form in the novel Burnt Toast. And his second novel, Right Naked, won the National Green Earth Book Award for Young Adult Eco-Fiction. So tonight, we look forward to Peter reading from Horse Drawn Yogurt, which is a patchwork of true stories of his decade of farm life on Total Loss Farm, about how locals and newcomers helped each other out in a pivotal moment of history that many of us participated in. So welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. There. Um, I was really trying to decide which one to read. Uh, it is true, when I, when I first came to Vermont in October of 1969, I was a member of the Back to the Land movement, but I like to explain that, uh, in my opinion, most of the people who came, almost all the people who, who, uh, who came, had no idea it was a movement. And they, they had an individual reason, or they were with somebody else, and both of them had an individual reason for, to, 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 to come. And they were not inspired by any book that they've read or anything like that. They just, uh, we were, uh, for the most of our uh, part, we were so upset uh, uh, about the Vietnam War and about the direction that the country, the, the country was going that um, some of us who had the luxury to do so, and also some of us who were escaping really bad situations in the, in the cities where, where we lived or, or in families where we lived, they gravitated, felt the gravitational pull of a particular place, a particular farm. And I had some friends who had just bought a farm uh, in Guilford. And I, I said, I must go there to, uh, to visit. So I went there to visit, and it took me about a year to actually decide to move up. To Hi, John. Come on, in. Come on in. There's a seat there. There's a seat right beside you. And anyway, uh, we all had it, uh, individual reasons to come to, to these farms. For me, uh, I was a stutterer, and I I I had just I had just about done enough with my with my brain for the uh, for my life up to that to that point. I, I was educated. I decided I would become a Sanskrit scholar. Went to Harvard, a, a graduate school. I had a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, which was going to be a five-year fellowship at the end of, uh, with quite a lot of money to study Sanskrit up on the fifth floor at a Widener Library and read ancient texts. And this is while the world outside was just going to hell and blowing up with war. And uh, uh, destruction, and um, it was not the best t uh, the best time of year to be to be in graduate school. So I dropped out. I became a yo-yo, going back and forth from the west coast to the east coast, and I landed here. And every single thing that I that I wrote at the farm, and every single thing I've written since then, has been about finding my voice, because uh, I had always known that even though I was a very quiet person with an inability to speak out 
uh, in public that I had a lot to say, and I and some of you have seen my mime shows, so I learned you know how to do all this <laughs> stuff, and I, I I made a living with John's brother Stephen for about fifteen or twenty or twenty years performing uh, performing theater all over the world. Uh, but it was still about uh, about it was my in individual journey to, to find my voice, which I expressed in Burnt Toast. This is about a young young man about who knows how old, 18 or 19, uh, leaving on a, on a quest to find words to, to become a writer. And my second book was about a was about a 16 year old boy uh, who uh, uh, found a typewriter, and uh, and this typewriter was uh, was. Um, it was almost magic, and it seemed to give him uh, to give him the faculty to discover the words that he had himself inside to become a storyteller. If anybody had told me when I was a kid that uh, the fact that I was a, a a painful stutterer meant that that I was going to grow up and be a storyteller, I would have just given a great big swift <laughs> kick. <laughs> so, you never know. Uh, pe people people who who worked in theater in my town where I was growing up said you should be in, in, in theater because you have a very interesting interesting funny funny face and you would really like the, the life in the theater and i said i will never do theater <laughs> it only goes to say that you should never say never uh, some of the stories in this book i, I wrote and they're, they're all about coming coming to the farm and uh, and finding my voice and this book now is mostly true i mean it's all true uh, true stories some of the true stories are slightly embellished, hmm. but not too much. They, they don't really veer, uh, veer too away from the actual facts. Uh, you want to hear one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this one is, is the, well, the first story in the book is, a, is the story which I just recently wrote about how I, how I came to the farm and why. I, I, I was finished the book and I was just about to, to hand it in and it started with the story that you're about to hear. But I decided, no, the, the book is not, is not complete yet unless I bring myself to the farm. And so the first story that you read when you actually have the book in your hand is about how I came to the farm. And this one is called Losing Old Pal. Two dogs resided a total loss farm. Barf Barf was a black and white collie who had come with the place. Mamushka was the Siberian husky who had jumped onto the front seat of my old Volvo sedan when I was visiting friends in the city. She smelled the farm on me and smelled Barf Barf as well. She insisted on moving to Vermont and her human owners followed soon after. Dogs on our farm had few responsibilities. The, 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 uh, 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 they alerted us to uh, 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 visitors' arrivals and helped us round up our wandering cow. They provided subjects for con conversations uh, uh, and company on walks. Barf Barf had a fatal weakness for running deer. A dog's wide foot pads can lightly skim a snow crust late in the season when a deer's sharp hooves will break through. The frantic deer will leave a trail of blood where her legs are cut by the ice. Neighbor dogs join the hunt. They leave their, they leave their domesticity in the dooryard. And for them, it's a howling pack game ending in an orgy of blood and eating unless a hunter hearing the chase can get there first. That's what Ed Hardy did. He put a bullet in Barf Barf's brain. The other dogs scattered and the deer got away. Luckily, Barf Barf had made a deposit in Mamushka before he died. From her litter, we kept two. I named my male puppy Old Pal, a name I borrowed from the label on the rusty metal box where I kept my fishing tackle. Old Pal grew up big, slow-moving, and quiet, with deep yellow eyes in which I perceived preternatural canine wisdom. Uh, the other people on the farm thought that Old Pal didn't have much upstairs, but they didn't know him like I did. Old Pal and I came to know the woods in all four directions from the farm. We were both new in those parts. We rambled by day and night, on trail and off trail, but I nearly lost him when he was only five months old. A summer journey carried me away. When I returned in early September, he was gone. I couldn't blame anyone. Old Pal was my responsibility, and I had not been there at a formative time of his youth. Uh, uh, Michael poked his head uh, out of the... Uh, uh, a back of the VW bug he was working on. He always had his head next to a motor. 
I don't know, Pete. He scratched his neck with a greasy finger. Pal's been gone for a few days. Somebody said they saw him follow some people from the Brotherhood of the Spirit. <laughs> the name was new to me. It was 1970 and communes had begun to poke up everywhere like skunk cabbage in springtime. <laughs> uh, 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 10 or 20 people would, would pool their resources and, 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 uh, and put a payment down on a derelict farm where they could purchase a cheap patch of forest and throw up a hemlock log yurt or a longhouse or a geodesic dome. To the locals they have, may have been an alien invasive species, but to themselves they had a dreamlike inner logic. They build up a surprising, instant, tenacious belonging to wherever they bloomed and a certainty, both innocent and arrogant, that they would remain in this new place for the rest of their lives. The Brotherhood of the Spirit, I asked. It's down at Johnson's Pasture, you know, up above it, up on Owl's Head. I knew the hilltop Owl's Head well. It was one of our destinations for old pal and me. To get there, you left our commune, the first. Headed west from the corners past the driveway to Tree Frog Farm, the second, descended to the Troll Bridge and made a right at the T. Just by that bridge is where the ideas for most of my stories used to hang out. There's probably a, a few still there. You're welcome to go pick, pick one if you like. Look up in the trees. If you walk a few steps from there, hang a right and take the crescent shaped trail uh, to, to, uh, 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 toward. Uh, a Weatherhead's Hayfield, and head right again at the next tee along the flat. Soon you'll be at Johnson Pasture, the third commune. Walk past the main house, the one rebuilt after the fatal fire, if it's still there, and follow the switchback path up to the summit. Some people used to claim that Owl's Head was a cosmic vortex. I figured that's where the Spirit Brotherhood, number four, would be. How did it happen that there were four completely different communes within a mile of each other in an isolated forest near the border of Vermont and Massachusetts? For the past 200 years in that forest, only decent, God-fearing, Protestant blood families had tried to make a go of dairying, sheep raising, sugaring, and logging. There was not a recent sign of any of that old life on the walk I took that morning. It was just a lot of overgrown stone walls. All those rugged individuals were gone. In their place, the woods were full of communists. <laughs> in the lowlands in the cities, U.S. Communist Party membership had dropped to an all-time low. The party was infiltrated by law enforcement spies, broken by union busting, pursued by the House on American Activities Committee and its leaders high on Richard Nixon's hit list. Over in Russia, the criminal leadership were all fossilized. They held on to their Iron Curtain empire with tanks and secret police, and life in Soviet Russia seemed no example to follow. It suffered in the comparison to the other chief world system, U.S. consumer capitalist creature comfort culture. Nobody but a few Albanians and Cubans wanted to be a Soviet uh, 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 communist anymore. And meanwhile, Ronald Reagan was rehearsing for the presidency, honing his act as governor of California. He would soon, with the help of the Afghan Mujahideen, bring the whole evil empire to its knees. So it should have been a time when no young Americans would turn to communism by their own free will but hundreds of thousands did. It started when we rejected the homegrown evil of the Vietnam War and went on a collective high. Jimi Hendrix claimed the national anthem on his electric guitar for a generation who hated the grown-ups' war. The war was on television. Fleeing both, thousands fled to the country for the last gasp of simple industrial age machinery before the computer age descended upon us for a few years in the boondocks in every single state. A pre-Soviet, all-American, transcendental communism flourished. Folks moved back to the land and shared all they had, which often wasn't much. A few communards died in fire, four at the Johnson's pasture, and several went off the drug deep end, but far fewer than died of fire and drugs in the cities. And there were so many different kinds of communes to choose from. People gathered around a, a left-wing, uh, politics or group therapy or organic farming or new age religion or, uh, or meditation, music, women's empowerment, sexual practice, food, uh, North American vision, witchcraft, Eastern religion. The Brotherhood of the Spirit was a flock of wide-eyed believers in the teenage visionary Mike Metallica, believers who had pledged to follow him wherever he, w he, had, he went and he had gone to squat on a cosmic ray bombarded rock on the summit of Owl's Head Mountain. <laughs> Pilgrims found their way to the road past our unexciting, past, past our uh, unexcited co uh, 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 collective house and, and towards, towards Metallica's uh, uh, 
Visionary A. Reed. Old pal must have seen a group of them go by and tagged along. Old pal loved to join any human expedition. Well, I would find him. I would take that path. I was a communar too, although of a different stripe. We all spoke English, I supposed, so we would be able to communicate. As I headed down the road I had just described to you, with my red bandana and my rock maple walking stick, I breathed slowly and deeply. I was practicing harmlessness, non-judgmentalism, and forgiveness, the time-tested three-legged support of any spiritual program. <laughs> From what my farm family told me, the Brotherhood of the Spirit was just the kind of guru-driven, vegetarian, crazed, dropout, give up all your worldly goods, put on your overalls and granny dress, and remove your shoes. Uh, the, uh, Patriarch gets to fuck all the young women, unwashed hippie commune that gave our thoughtful agrarian utopia a bad name in the straight press. Mm -hmm. I had no plan to critique uh, Mike Metallica's club, nor to join it. I just wanted my dog back. <laughs> <laughs> Soon enough, I was walking on my favorite flat part of the trail. It was very, even those very woods that Barf Barf had met his bullety death the previous winter. Now, although it was sunny and comfortably warm, the changing light and the coloring leaves presaged the approaching autumn and the chill beyond. At our farm, we were already loading the woodshed, insulating walls, fattening the pig, and filling the, filling the canning room and the freezer for the coming cold months. Were they doing that at the Brotherhood of the Spirit? Or did they live only in the present? Or in Shunyata, the cosmic void, where no cast iron stove could warm them? When winter came, would they disappear, or would they gather in one cabin and huddle like bees around, in this case, their king, and all keep warm by simply vibrating? The ones on the outside, <laughs> overcoated with frost? <laughs> Briefly at the pasture, I greeted old friends I hadn't seen for many weeks. They were harvesting a large garden. They were getting ready for winter, but they had time to stop and talk and raise an eyebrow toward the hill above them, where the spirit folk had swarmed. Fritz straightened up from his work. He pulled on his old rope suspenders and pointed toward Owl's head with his quince wood cane. Yep, I think old Paul's up there, Pete, he said. Good luck getting him back. I crossed the little stream that divided the pasture from the neighbor uh, uh, highland, and I headed for the winding path up Owl's Head Mountain. I suffer from an optimism that, depending on how you look at it, either helps me solve problems or gets me into trouble. I never even asked myself, is it? foolhardy for a solitary, smiling person to plunge into a cult-addled, possibly violent, brainwashed throng in the middle of the forest to extricate a puppy? <laughs> Owl's head is not very high. In a few moments, I emerged from the trail into the clearing just below the summit. There was a small cabin just below the peak from which the vibrations emanated in sine waves I could almost see. In the area between me and the cabin, clots of truly transfigured people stood about or in the lunch line. They were all skinny. Some of them were bearing cut-up brush toward a large fire. Some stood behind a long table dishing out brown rice and vegetables from the largest wok I had ever seen. <laughs> in those days, among many uh, uh, communards, brown rice was the major nutrient of their mostly meatless lives. It was a, Jap it was a Japanese plot to unload all this unchewable grain that no Asian wanted to eat. You had to prove your dedication to the Spartan spiritual life by chewing each mouthful of food 50 times, and this was especially hard for those like me who had grown up low in spit. <laughs> I think you, 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 you can all remember that. Several men and women turned and va vacantly regarded me with the unmistakable gaze of chronic protein deficit. <laughs> Still others watched me, then turned to look up toward the leader's cabin from where I suppose they expected good counsel to come. I stood silently holding my hiking staff, smiling above my red bandana. I had arrived in heaven, or a bizarrely elevated underworld without a guide. <laughs> oh, but I would have a guide on my way back. A little dog would lead me out. Just below the crazy plank steps leading into the cabin, old pal sat displaying that yellow-eyed deep wisdom I mentioned before, for which I speculated he had already won respect among the flock he was visiting. <laughs> he had positioned himself close to the leader, but not within the council house. His tongue hung at an odd angle to the left and below his jaw. I've come to get my dog, I announced to, them, to, the, to the multitude. This old pal, he's mine. There was little response. 
Why would they deign to descend to my level, to my miserable clinging, my ludicrous notions of private property? <laughs> Had there been a debate, I would have lost it. Anyway, he was one of them now. They'd gotten to him over the past few days. <laughs> Let's see if he would follow me. Gazing deep into old pal's eyes, I saw there no support for my claim. <laughs> when, when you look into the humor around any dog's eyeballs, you'll find no confirmation of any delusion you may have that you own this fur-covered, warm being. It is a relationship of faith, consent, and discipline, but not of property. I knew that. So did the men around me who I imagine knew everything they knew with a scourged, self-abnegated certainty. And even the downcast, second-class women of this misnamed brotherhood, who somewhere inside of them may have begun to doubt their choice from the menu uh, uh, of communal <laughs> options. They could have picked a profit-sharing, carnivore, lesbian, feminist dude ranch in Montana. Much more fun. <laughs> Even the brilliantly blue-eyed, long-haired teenage prophet who emerged from the cabin naked and sexually satisfied and who regarded me from the top step and held me for a long time in his gaze. I knelt and whispered into old pal's ears. I reminded him of the place where he'd been born and of the genuine vitamin-enriched dog chow awaiting him back <laughs> in the dooryard <laughs> and the beef bones. We were a real farm, I told him. I told him, whoa, 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 whoa. with domestic animals, with gardens of vegetables and flowers, with a mother who loved him, responsibilities, work to do. I, I spoke of his dead father and of the love I felt for him. I am a dog person. To this day, when a dog looks at me, through me, in a certain, in a certain way, automatic way, I still feel a pleasurable pulse at the base of my left thumb, a nonverbal near awakening that reminds me of all we have in common. Apologizing for my recent absence, I stroked old pal's broad forehead. I gave him good eye contact. I saw the effects of his recent indoctrination fade and recognition return to his eye. <laughs> He yawned and stretched audibly as dogs do, breaking a spell. And as he led me to the edge of the clearing and to the trailhead down, perhaps I do not totally anthropomorphize if I recall that in the instant before we entered the woods, the old pal paused and looked back at the clearing and the people, relinquishing the rewards of the spiritual life he would now uh, abandon, <laughs> the mountaintop he would not seek again. <laughs> The brother of the spirit left Owl's Head before Snowfoot. Their pooled trust funds brought them, bought them a farm in Warwick, Massachusetts, and then a city block of Turner's Falls, an old red brick mill town left to ruin by a global tool corporation who had headed south and east to, to, hire cheap, to, to hire cheaper labor. Spring and summer followed that winter. Old pal, my constant companion, grew, in, grew it into a bigger dog slow and quiet, trusting and agreeable as he had to be. At night he would put his front paws over my shoulder and hang still as I lugged him up the ladder to our room above the tractor shed. He would sit still and not nip when my pliers pulled half a hundred porcupine quills from his nose. He'd lie in the grass on the peach orchard hill and let me use his gently rising, falling rib cage for a pillow. In the winter of his second birthday, old pal left the farm again, not in search of spiritual salvation, but of deer flesh on the hoof. Other local dogs joined him. The sound of the pack carried up all the way to, to the end of Baja, Prince Road. A hunter, perhaps the same one, heard the chase, grabbed his, his ready rifle, and set out to protect his sport and his food supply. Old pal never came back. That hunter had cut Pal off as he closed in on his prey. The harried, bleeding deer had switched back down a ledgy cliff wall that the wind had swept bare of snow. Whoa. Uh, with better footing, she put some distance between her and the yelping, blood-mad pack. As the dogs crossed the hunter's sight, he squeezed the trigger and sent old Pal to that mountaintop, that spirit brotherhood where his master could not go to claim him and bring him home. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've been writing these stories, true stories of the farms, since 
since 1970. They didn't go, the, one of them went into burnt toast and it, it, it's fiction. But the rest I've just been working on for many years and finally decided, uh, uh, Molly's, my wife Molly is here, the book is dedicated to her because every time I work on something else, she says, why aren't you writing, working on your farm book? So <laughs> that, I, that I did, I've been working on them for a long time. It was long. a harmonic conversion <coughs> because the Historical Society this year in, in Barrie is, did a whole exhibit on the 70s. So. Mm -hmm. So it, it seemed like that. the right it's thing great. to do at this time. But, and so I've, some of the stories that I, I've had for a while, uh, I've rewritten. And I, I spent a lot of time alone at, at home, and I read them out, out loud to myself. And if they, I, 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 if they pass a tears test, then I, I know they're, they're OK to put in, in the book. I'm getting used to reading them out, out loud. But at first, when I was reading out loud, I would get to a certain point in the story, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go on. Mm -hmm because it, it's emotional. Mm -hmm. And because of this, uh, the, uh, the historical society doing this work about, about the Back to the Land movement, I've been approached by about three or four different uh, uh, reporters and scholars from around the, the, around the country who are doing, doing exhibitions or articles about, about our farm. And, and three of them have come, and I've brought them out uh, to the farm, and when I when I start to talk about these things, I also get over, uh, I come with, with emotion, and I try to explain to them that I've read a lot of books that other people have written about the farm, and I've read a lot of books that other people have written about what people did after they left the farm, and I want to spend time with the with the reporters and the writers who come because I really want them to uh, uh, get it right. I think it's a really important important story and one of the things I loved so much about the two women who mounted the, the exhibition up in Barry, you should all go see it, it's still there, was that they totally got the fact that the Back to the Land movement of the 70s laid all the seeds for what's going on in Vermont now with organic farming, with, with the non-GMO uh, movement, with, uh, with the golden age that we're living in of beer, uh, uh, cheese, uh, kimchi, all these wonderful artisan, artisan foods that are coming up and out, and it, it was all started. I, I was one of the four farmers who started the farmer's market at, uh, in Brattleboro, and it's now the most successful one in the state, and I, I like to walk around there and just, <laughs> I don't have to say anything because I just know. But, um, but there were, uh, anyway, so this is usually the time if anybody has any comment or question, comments to each other or questions for me. I'm, I'd be pleased. How many people were on the farm and how long did it go on? Yeah, the photograph on the back of Home Comfort is of the, of the farm at its heyday. This was probably taken in 1973, and I think there's about 14 or 15 people in the photo. We were never a farm that, that let just anybody come. We were all friends or friends of friends, and people would People stayed for a year, two years. I, I stayed for nine years. And um, if somebody knew wanted to, to come, it, it, it was like a college application. And then it was. Uh, and then, uh, so, so Veranda, Veranda Porch, who's this wonderful poet, still lives at the farm. She's still writing about it. And she hosted my reading on, on Sunday in the, the big room where I used to live. Uh, and she, you know, we're still, I mean, I serve on the board of the, the trusteeship that owns the, the place now. We'd like to find a young family uh, to come and live there. Um, the, the opportunity that we had it is gone because, uh, because in the 60s and 70s, you could still find a really inexpensive side hill farm. And as I mentioned in four or five stories here, uh, the people who own the farms were really ready to leave. And uh, in, in many cases, their children <coughs> had left. They'd gone to the Vietnam War, they died, or they had uh, come back broken or upset, or they, they didn't want to lead the hard life that their parents and grandparents had lived, and they were moving to, to the cities. So they were very, very happy that this new generation, back to the land people, wanted to find out everything about what they did. How do you make cheese? How do you milk a, a, a cow? What's the, best, what's the best time to spread lime on the, uh, on the fields? You know, what, what's, the best, uh, what's the best variety of open pollinated uh, uh, corn, corn to grow? What's that machine for? Oh, do you think it still has a couple of years in it? And that was our life. And uh, um, uh, 
Hi, it was genuine. Yeah. How did you come up with the title, and is that a difficult process? Oh, um, so everybody sh should get the book, and you should read it. There's a story inside this book, which it, it, it is called Horse Drawn Yogurt. And uh, <clears throat> I don't want to give away the, the secret why Horse Drawn Yogurt, because the story, the flagship story in this book of the same name explains why Horse Drawn Yogurt is the name of the story and therefore the name of the book. So uh, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry. And it, uh, <clears throat> but there's other stories in there. There's a wonderful story in there called Life is Short, Eat More Pie. And for five or six years while I've been working on this book, that was the, the, the working title for the book too. But, but I'm, not an, uh, I'm not an authoritarian imperative guy and it seemed like that, that was too much of an imperative. Eat more pie, so I just, mm -hmm. you'll see that story in there too. <clears throat> Life is short, eat more pie was the sign that I had on my booth at, at the farmer's market because I bake pies. Mm -hmm. So you're also an illustrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the illustrations were all done by, by me, except for the, you know, the, like the cover, the cover illustration. Very nice. The, the, this hangs in our kitchen. Uh, it's a remnant of the kitchen where I used to live, and on the wall that's next to it is this photo uh, uh, of my son and me on the farm with a, a, a chicken house that I that I built. And th th there's some uh, some poems in the book too. I'm a poet also, and one of the poems is about uh, um, a conf confrontation between a rooster and me. <laughs> <laughs> The rooster lived in that in that house. So, so when, when, when you read the poem, you can you can get a sense of it. <clears throat> I, but, but I tell a lie. These illustrations I did a while ago, and I'm not even sure that I have it in me to put my glasses on and lean over and dip that quill in the Indian ink and do that kind of fine, delicate work anymore. I'm afraid of it. Slip. <laughs> Did your son follow your same way of life, or is he <coughs> branched off? And... Uh, he's a, a builder contractor uh, in, in Brattleboro. I think he's probably like me in that there's probably not a day of his life that goes by that he doesn't give some thought to, to the farm where, where he spent the first six years of his of his life. And I mean, building forts in the woods and, and learning uh, the, the names of all the trees and things like that. So uh, if you asked him, if you followed it in my footsteps, he would say no. <laughs> Is he a writer? No, he's not a writer. Did you have electricity? Yeah, we had electricity. I, I like to tell people for, for the nine years I lived on the farm, we didn't have a bathroom, we just, right. just had an house. We had electricity. Didn't have a TV, didn't have a radio, didn't have a phone, except at the very, very end of my years there. Never wore a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Didn't, didn't uh, uh, own a flashlight. I just loved to to walk at night. I didn't care how dark it was. I, I never got got lost. I just got to have such a, an amazing sense of comfort in the woods at, at night. If I had a flashlight, I, I, I would not have been able to see. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I felt, and uh, we um, the, the first couple of years that we were there, we cut all our wood with a, a two-man mm -hmm. saw or two two-person saw because because the women were strong, and uh, and then we got a chainsaw. Uh, we had a tractor. You heat so, with wood. Yeah, he heated with. I, I still heat with wood. Me too. I, I, still I, I just yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We um, but we you know that we. Every almost almost every single craft or uh, farm activity that we did, we didn't go for it the, the easy way. If we had to dig a new farm well, we would never think to to hire the backhoe man to come and do the work in, in three or four hours. We we worked on it for three weeks, you know, <laughs> you know getting deeper and deeper down underground with buckets and you know with at the some some point in the summer with the the you know the midday sun you know. Sh shining down into this great big 15 foot deep hole when you pulled up a bucket as much stuff washed down with the wet <laughs> soil into the hole 
as you had just lifted out with the bucket. Uh, we didn't mind. We, we were naked and we were working hard, and I had such beautiful muscles. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that well, is, the, the well is still there. It, it, it still has water in it. Mm -hmm. Every chimney I built, it, it, except yeah. one, is still standing. How deep did you have to go? About 17 feet or so. Oh. And then we, uh, uh, then when after it was it was done, we were we were holding back the. You know the uh, the sides of the of the well with uh, uh, hemlock planks. We you know we, we got the we got the men to, to come up and to drop gravel and then th three uh, well tiles like, or, or four well tiles and they're they're probably four feet high, right? So it's just a bit, just to just to get it above ground. It's overgrown now. It's very hard to find, but it's still there. Did you douse for it? To, do we not, no, uh, we didn't have to douse. I mean, I would have. I, I had no problem with, with dousing, but it was so obvious where, where the watercourses were on, on the hill. You know, that we did it at the confluence of, uh, of two very wet spots. <coughs> That's a great question. Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, does it take you back? Yeah. So, did you grow everything that you ate? Um, we we grew everything we ate except for oil for vegetable oil. And uh, we grew everything that we smoked, and we grew everything that we uh, that. Uh, and we didn't we didn't really have enough have enough land or, or capacity to grow flour. In those same nine years, we never bought, we never bought a loaf of bread once. We really didn't even buy any flour. I would I would drive down in uh, an old car or truck to New York City, which is the closest we could buy 100 pound bags bags of wheat berries and rye berries. Yeah, Smith. And yeah, yeah, and we ground them by hand. We had a little flour, flour grinder, and it was just amazing. And, and the, in order to get the, the best flour for the bread, you had to put it through twice. Right, and right. Twice. Always. And uh, oh, in, uh, it was unbelievably cups. hard work. And, and the, 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 there were six or seven of us on, on the farm who baked. And everybody had a different, uh, different style of bread. I, I, I loved the... A Jewish rye bread, you know, but, but but very heavy, real salty. And other people uh, made made breads which which were sweeter and, and softer. There were there were always loaves of bread there to eat. But we didn't. Uh, so what else did we buy? We didn't. We didn't. We tried not to go into town to the supermarket to buy fresh vegetables in the winter because that was the whole point. We had frozen and canned so, so much stuff. And to buy the brown rice. Yeah, as, so you can imagine we also bought the brown rice. Uh, but we had so much meat because we had uh, 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 chickens and pigs and, uh, and steer uh, in the freezer and eggs. Um, but you can imagine with the lack of fresh, uh, fresh <coughs> vegetables that by, by this time, time of year, you were getting pretty bored with what was it on your canning, your canning shelf and in the freezer. Mm -hmm. to, you know, 25 quarts of wax beans. For, <laughs> who even likes wax beans? <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you thaw them out and whoosh, they were instantly whoosh, limp and looked like something that might have been served in a high school cafeteria in, in, in the 50s. Or so. Did you all disband at the same time? or? Oh, that's a wonderful uh, uh, question. Um, just as everybody, I believe, had an individual reason for coming to the farm, in, in my case, and it actually in many people's cases, it was about finding your voice and finding what was your real reason for being in the, in the world, people began to develop an individual reason to, to, to leave. So the answer is we did not all disband at the same time. At that, that time that I left in uh, June, of, June or July of 1978, three of us left, and we all moved into, into town uh, uh, close by. Uh, there were two people who lived at the farm for almost all the years that I was there who didn't take too much part in the activities of the farm. They preferred to, to, to work in town, and so they, they would leave however they could get to town in, in a carpool. They would ski down to the bottom of the, of the hill and uh, uh, catch a ride. And they worked in town and they brought their money back. And it wasn't much money, they had menial jobs. But, um, but just about the time that, that the the uh, national economy changed and people began to, to be more prosperous and there was a need for more money to come in. We, we didn't, one of the reasons that we could live together was nobody had student debt, nobody had any kind of insurance, 
at all. Nobody, I mean, we, you know, we, we grew almost all of our own food. Uh, that the mortgage was 200, $225 a month for, for 10 years from the farmer's wife. And, and so nobody really had any, any much need for money. And we had enough money at the farm because we, we wrote the books, which we sold in New York City to publishers who were hungry for the story. And also we had some money from the people who were working in town. But gradually, it, actually four or five different people at the farm began to have a yen to leave and to be more active in the outside world. And you began, people would come up to, to visit and you could tell that they dressed differently and they smelled differently and they were getting involved in interesting stuff in, in the cities, in, in politics and culture and art. My mother, who was a, a real trooper, would come up and I'd, I'd help her climb up into my, into my, my bed, which was in a, in a wall in, in the room I built above the tractor, the tractor shed, and she would lean over and I'd say, are you okay? You go through Yeah, I'm fine. She said, but are you using your gifts? <laughs> no, in other words, because she knew how hard I worked, and she knew that I wasn't writing very much, and she knew I wasn't using my Spanish, and I wasn't, you know, I, she, you know she was always so excited about how artistic and creative I was, and mm. here I was at the farm, and I, I looked like I was skinny, and I was working really hard, and I had a, a son who was dressed very, you know, haphazardly, and, uh, and she just, she wanted, and so everybody, Almost everybody at a certain point began to think there must be more to life than, than this. And they're, you know, I have some gifts, I have some, some, some ambitions, which I can see are not gonna, going to be satisfied here. So one by one, people left the farm. Uh, when they left the farm, new people came, but they didn't stay as long. And they didn't, they didn't actually uh, uh, inculcate the same kind of relationship to the land. But it would seem as though it was really a seminal point in your life, oh. you know, thinking about all that sprang. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, like I say, there's not a day that goes, that goes by, even when I, I'm not writing, that I don't think about it, that I don't remember it, that I don't, I don't remember some lesson that I learned at the farm, that I don't, appreci that I don't I appreciate the relationship that I, I, that I have to, 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 to money because of having been at the farm, mm -hmm. and also that feeling of international solidarity, you know, that even though in our case, it, I, mean, I mean, it was awkward and maybe put on, I, I still have it, you know, so that it, 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 it was a very, very important phase of my life. It still is. Do you um, think that farm could exist today? Uh, it does. <laughs> it, you can, yeah, it does. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. So, and what's going on at the farm today? After you left, what went on besides poetry? Well, there were, uh, I mean, I think I've got to write another book. Because in, I didn't even put uh, uh, Shakespeare in, in, this, in, in this book. I mean, in 1970, 75, uh, 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 John Carroll moved to the farm, and he came up for, from Boston, and he said, we're going to do Shakespeare here. And I was like, but we have so much work to do. And he said, you're going to be in it. You're going to be in a, a, a Midsummer Night's Dream. And I fought him all the way. I just fought him all the way. And, and then when I did Midsummer Night's Dream, I got bitten by the Shakespeare bug. And, and I didn't know back then that I would go on to direct 65 or 70 productions of Shakespeare with, with kids. <laughs> That's what I do now for, you know, for, for my living. And I found it in my Shakespeare camp, and every day I wear a different t-shirt for my Shakespeare camp. I won't embarrass Molly by, by looking to see which Shakespeare camp shirt I have. But, um, but there, there's a whole other book that needs, that, that needs to be written. You say the farm does still exist. There are certain very su successful communes around the United States that, that, that still exist. But uh, the, but there are few. There, there were thousands then. <coughs> yeah. What were you doing up there to feed your um, idea of uh, international um, brotherhood of some kind? Were you reading together? What was going? How did you nurture that particular attitude? We read a lot of books. Uh, out loud, we were aware of what was going on in the outside world. We subscribed to uh, uh, Granma. Do you, do you know Granma? It's the official newspaper of the uh, 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 Cuban Communist Party. Somebody, as a joke, 
got us a lifetime subscription, and it arrived at our house in the mailbox every every month. I have no idea who who subscribed, but it was full of communist propaganda about this or that. It was, no, it, it was in a, it was the English version. The, it was in a big it was in a big uh, Manila envelope. The stamps had always been steamed off. <laughs> Somebody in the post office you know, has a really good <laughs> but but it, but it was it was very nice nice of the person I don't know whether it was he or she but but they sent it on to the farm so we, we read about we, we got our vision about everything that was going on for the world through that strange glasses to look through and we and also our farm was a famous farm and people came up every weekend and they had news from the city. They wanted. They wanted to. to they wanted. They, they arrived on Friday night. It was almost never a weekend when a, a car full didn't come up. And we look out to see who was there. We didn't have a phone. They hadn't written to see who was there. Usually, people we were very happy to see, and they and they brought brought us interesting stuff to eat sometimes. But, mo but mostly, they wanted they wanted to sit down with us and share our life and get get rid of their city clothes. If it was a woman, they usually wanted to sleep with to sleep with one of the men, and it was a, and it was really interesting that way because we would look. Who is this? Oh my God! <laughs> and, uh, it, it never happened to to to, to me. Uh, <laughs> I was in a relationship anyway. So, um, but we got there were different. We didn't have the internet or TV. Or a radio, or the phone, but there are other ways to to, to get news of the uh, of the world. You get them from people people who travel. There were there were besides the people who lived on, on communes, there was a class of people who traveled from commune to commune. There there really were, uh, uh, like tinkers, like uh, you know something like that. They traveled from farm to farm, bringing bringing information and and letting us hear news about a barn dance. I had a sister farm, and we got our news that way too. And so we were very aware of what was what was going on in the outside world. Peter, you mentioned John Carroll. Is that the John Carroll that lives here in Orford? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No. no. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think so. Norwich. Hmm? Norwich. We have a John Carroll who lives in Norwich. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, that, that's the one. And he's, he's a big fan of Shakespeare. Oh, cool. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? What yeah. Did you ever get any resistance from the <coughs> redneck population, shall we say? Not at all. Yeah. No. Really? People were so helpful. I mean, they were so, for the most part, they were so glad that we were we were there. They came over to, to, uh, to help us out. And we, we, we saved their lives in so many different ways. We, we showed up when they were, they were haying. I mean, I very quickly learned how to back up to how to back a full wagon, you know, full of 200 bales of, of hay backwards into into a barn, up a steep up a steep slope into the barn where if I had made a wrong move, the whole thing would have, would have pitched over. We were all always there to help, help out, and they were always there to help us out. There's a, a lot about that in the book. Uh, there were some redneck people who you know who who was trying to pretend that they were threatening. Them. They were a small minority. Thanks to you. Mm -hmm. The, uh, we had FBI come up to the farm on a few occasions, <laughs> yeah. looking for fugitives, <laughs> looking for terrorists, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, domestic terrorists, <laughs> not international yeah. terrorists. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest challenge you faced on the farm? Uh, biggest challenge? Well, it is a challenge, isn't it, to learn how to live with a group of people. I mean, some of the people didn't really work very hard. Some of the some of the people smoked cigarettes all all the time. Some of the people drank coffee and sat around in the, in the kitchen just yakking and talking while the rest of us worked harder. Uh, uh, you know, learn, and when I left when I left the farm after nine years, I felt like man, that was an uh, I've had enough living in a group for the rest of my life. Uh, that that was a real challenge. It, I, uh, it was a challenge. It was all every job that we did was a challenge because it was not a particular they were didn't usually represent a particular skill that I that I'd, I'd had growing up I had to learn how to to do stuff that I never thought that I'd have to learn how to do how to slaughter a pig how to make sausage once the pig was slaughtered 
-hmm. You know, I read from some handbook, you have to turn the small intestine inside out, okay? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Oh, you take a broom, right, and you stick it between your legs, all right, and then you take the small <laughs> intestine and you like roll it down <laughs> until it's completely inside out, you know, and then you pull it off from the other end and you have It was really embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> so things like that to learn how to do it, how to do that stuff. It was a, it was all challenging, but it's the kind of challenges I love. Good kind. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like for your son living on the commune? <laughs> well, he um, sometimes he, he and I he and Molly will will we'll, we'll have a will we'll have a glass of wine or two, and we'll go out and have a beer. And when he's had a couple of beers or a couple of glasses of wine, he'll say, "Dad, I wouldn't change a thing." Mm -hmm. How old was he when you left? Six. Oh. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but um, uh, uh, he left the he left the farm with with me and went to town. His mother stayed there, so he so he spent a lot of he spent a lot of time going back there mm -hmm. to be to, to be with her. Town. Were there other children? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he homeschooled. No. Actually, no. We we thought it was important to send to send him to the public school. So so it was. Uh, he actually went to to the to the local Brownsboro Montessori school for a, a kindergarten for one year, and then Guilford School after that. He was at Guilford School for first and and second grade, and I enrolled him there in third grade. But uh, the principal called me up and said, you know, you don't really live here anymore, do you? you, you, you live in Brattleboro? I said, yeah. He said, well, that, that's where you should be. So I, I had to take him out of the Guilford, Guilford School and put him in Brattleboro. Uh, Molly, Molly and I had two, two other, other kids beside, besides him. We raised all three of them in Brattleboro, and they all went to, to the public schools. How far is the farm from Brattleboro? About nine miles. And about about thirty years or so. Tell about the cidering, though. Oh well, I, I have this wonderful story in in here about, about the cider press that that we got, and yeah, and you're gonna love that story. If the cider press was bigger than this room, and we we got it through a fluke, and it we we and it was just towards the end of my time at the farm. So I, I had a couple of years really working hard to make that cider press work. And it was the best cider that anybody anywhere in the world had ever made. It was all made from, from wind, windfall apples, from abandoned orchards, from heirloom, heirloom varieties, organic apples way up in the woods that we got. We had a big truck and we went around and gathered them. And uh, then when I left the farm, the orchard, which I which I had planted in the 70s, was lovingly maintained by somebody who lived who lived there. He was a lawyer, but he liked to come home after work and put on his over overalls and keep and keep the, the orchard mowed and a few times pruned. So now Molly and I go back there and the trees are in beautiful shape. We're a little bit slow about about pruning this year. Because last year we spent so many days pruning and then we didn't have a crop last year because of the of the uh, of the frost and and you know the season. So we, we but we had about three or four years before that of wonderful cider. We have a little press. Instead of making 25 gallons at a squeeze like the big cider press did, we have it, we had a, the one the one we have now makes about two gallons at a squeeze. And uh, for Veranda and, and her husband Richard and Molly and I had three or four really good falls when we made a beautiful cider together. Then Richard died. He's the first farm person to be buried at the at the farm, he's up on uh, he's up on top of the peach orchard mm. hill. You should go see his grave; it's beautiful. Get a nice view. Uh, so we still go back, and we make cider there. Is that what you want me to tell? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where's the big press? Huh? Where's the big press? The big cider press. It's 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 my favorite story. In this <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aren't you going to one more story? Mm -hmm. When I left the farm. I think that they tried to keep it going, but it was just way too uh, uh, complicated a machine. And it sat there gathering, gathering rain and snow and dust, and, and then somebody, somebody came and offered, uh, offered the, the folks at, at the farm a few bucks to take some of the parts. So it got, it, it got, got savaged. I mean, it got, you know, and then it, it was left on the, the, the chassis, the old truck chassis that it sat on, and it gradually sank into the, into the ground. 
Mm. You know, but it was a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. Mount Gilead Press in uh, 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 1925. Mm -hmm. Any other question? And uh, how about a response? What you heard, what you liked about what you, what you heard? Anything? Mm -hmm. I would like to get all the books, but I didn't bring my pocketbook, but I know where the bookstore is. <laughs> um, it, it, if you just want to want to stay, uh, I have some M&Ms and get a book and have it signed and just mingle and talk. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.